Okay. Good evening. My name is Tracy Schultz, and I am the chair of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Reconstruction Advisory Group. I am opening this meeting of the advisory group, and hereby call the meeting to order at 6 p.m. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting is being conducted via conference call and Microsoft Teams. Attendees should note that this meeting is being recorded and will be available after the meeting for attendees to download. The link will be located in the meeting's chat window and will be accessible for 21 days. Attendees should also note that the recording will include all audio, video, and user interaction within a Microsoft Teams app. Attendees calling in via phone will be included in the recording as audio only. Thank you for joining us this evening, whether you are online or dialing in. I'd like to give you some tips to help you save productive meeting using Microsoft Teams. First, for online users, if you don't currently see your toolbar in Microsoft Teams, and with your audio and video options, click anywhere on your screen, it should pop up near the center bottom of your screen. Everybody good with that? See, see that? Yeah, yeah. Once we open for questions and comments, if you have the raise your hand option, which is a hand icon on your toolbar, please use it to let us know you'd like to speak. If you do not see that option, you can click your microphone on and off to mute and unmute yourself to let us know that you'd like to speak. It will flash your name to let us know. For dial-in telephone users only, we will invite you to speak after the online speakers have finished. Star six will unmute you when our meeting facilitator, Melissa Bogdan, has asked you if you'd like to speak using the last four digits of your phone number. Once called upon, remember to press star six when it is your turn to speak. If you don't wish to speak when you hear your number, no problem, we'll move on to the next person. This is for dial-in telephone users only. For all participants this evening, remember we ask that you remain muted unless it is your turn to speak to avoid background noise. Please unmute yourself before you begin speaking. Melissa Bogdan will let you know when it is your turn, as well as the next person in line. We ask that you please introduce yourself by giving us your name, community you represent, before moving on with your question or comment. Keep in mind that sometimes there is a delay when meeting virtually, so let's all do our best not to speak over people. For members of the public calling in to join us, we invite you to listen in, but ask that you please refrain from disrupting the meeting. If members of the public pre-registered to comment on a specific agenda item, I will provide you an opportunity to comment after the agenda items presented. For members of the public that were unable to pre-register, I will provide you an opportunity to provide your comments at the end of the meeting before closing. So somebody is unmuted already, so somebody could, everybody can mute their microphones getting background noise already. So we appreciate everyone's patience and ask that you hold any comments until the designated time. For security reasons, the chat function in Microsoft Teams is enabled for MDOT personnel. Please ask questions verbally at the appropriate time as any posts entered in the chat window are not visible to staff and will not be responded to. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded in its entirety. Melissa Bogdan will now take a roll call of attendees. Thank you, Tracy. Um, first for our members, uh, Jack Broderick. Here. Hamilton Cheney. Nicholas Theotis. Barbara Hitchings. Here. 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 <laughs> Michael Lord. Uh, Patricia Lynch, I understand she had a conflict and she will be on later possibly. Jim Moran. Here. Jim Ports. Here. Sean Powell. Present. Kurt Regal. Kurt Regal is here. Tim Smith. Present. Tracy Schultz. Here. Steve Wilson. Um, as far as the elected officials that I have seen um, online so far, we have Kathy O'Donovan for Delegate Michael Malone. Present. We have Sarah Gannon for Councilman Nathan Volke. 
Present. We have Asia for Delegate Sid Saab. Present. And I see Ramon Robinson from Anne Arundel County DOT. Present. And Todd Mon from Queen Anne's County. I'm here, here. <laughs> okay, as for our staff, uh, is Richard Baker present? Uh, Robert Bain, Lenora Conti, Jamie Cornelius, Ken Fender, here. Here. Natalie Henson, Courtney Highsmith, here. Jim Harkness, here. Richard Hermillo. Richard, are you here? Here. Charles Kenny. Here. John Lancaster. Heather Lowe. I'm here. Glenn McGuire. Kelly Mellum. Kelly's here. Kim Millinder. I'm here. Mary O'Keefe. Present. Joanna Kill. Will Pines. Here. Robert Rager. Here. Mike Rice. Here. Brad Ryan. Here. Joseph Segal. Present. Colin Sweeten. Here. Kelly Leager. Here. Ebony Moore. Pilar Helm. Um, others, I see Greg Harvey from Queen Anne's County TV. Greg, are you with us? George. George. Is it, it's George or Greg? I'm sorry. Okay. And Bruce Grove, also from Queen Anne's County TV. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, if I missed any staff or if there are any other state employees on the line, please let me know now and take turns identifying yourself. So the minutes state can Senator accurately reflect. I'm sorry? State, Sen state Senator Rick Riley. Rick Riley? Welcome, thank you. Melissa, just a quick question. Some of us are called guests and others are not. What is the significance of that? Uh, as far as the teams thing, I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe you're outside of MDOT. That's why. The folks that are guests are um, attendees outside of the MDOT family. Uh, gotcha. Well, Thanks. Members yeah, we didn't need to leave you out. You're you're <laughs> you're part of the family. <laughs> uh, did I miss anyone else from the public? Okay, back to you, Tracy. Okay, I think we need to go back to one of our previous uh, opening remarks is to mute your phone or computer unless you are speaking. We're already having people, um, I guess, background noise feed over, so it's not going to go very well unless we can, everybody mutes their microphone until they speak, please. So I'd like to welcome everybody. hope everybody had a good new year. And hopefully this 2021 will be better than 2020. So I'd like to start out with the um, approval of our the draft minutes that were sent out. Does anybody have any questions or comments, corrections? If not, can they ask for a motion for to approve? I move uh, they be approved. Kurt Regal. Can I Jack second. Good job. I have a motion and a second. Anyone against? So, yeah. so moved. Okay, next thing we're going to move on to is the MBTA and SHA updates. 
some updates on the current projects from MDTA Chief Engineer Jim Harkness and then MDOT SHA Administrator Tim Smith. So whichever one of you wants to take it on and start first. <laughs> Okay. I'll, Jim, go ahead. Go ahead, Jim. Oh, okay. Thanks, Tim. Jim, okay. hold on a second while we. I'm going to get the matrix up on the screen here. Okay. As uh, Melissa's preparing to pull that up, uh, she's going to display the list of uh, 14 or so uh, current projects that MDTA has um, in either construction or in procurement or in design. And most of these projects, I think, are uh, ones that you've seen uh, in prior meetings. I think we might have had one drop off since the last meeting, um, and uh, I don't believe we've added any new ones. So I'm going to go through them and, and provide you um, maybe just a little slight description and, and, a, and some of the updates on things that have happened since um, your last meeting. So our first project is um, the BB2805. That's the cleaning and painting project uh, for Westbound Bridge. That project's been uh, out for a while. And in fact, it's um, now considered substantially complete since the last meeting. And, and we are actually preparing that for final closeout. So that'll be the last that you uh, see for this particular project. Our next project is BB2757. That's the um, 5 kV electrical improvements. So this project uh, is installing or replacing the 5 kilovolt uh, electric feed feeder system on the eastbound bridge. Um, it also has uh, additional work um, on both bridges to in, uh, install some SCADA equipment um, and that equipment will actually allow uh, for remote monitoring, uh, remote switching um, of the electrical system on, on the both bridges. It creates a loop um, because the bridge is fed from both shores by two different uh, utility companies. So um, if we should lose the feed from one shore, we'll be able to back feed essentially uh, to ensure that both um, bridges uh, electrical system stay functional if we uh, should have an issue. Um, this project is currently installing the necessary cable uh, brackets as well as the messenger system to be able to pull that, the, that cable uh, on the eastbound bridge. Um, there's some work on the shore ongoing uh, where they're doing directional boring and they've also installed some some hand boxes on the eastern shore. Okay, moving on, we have BB2754. That's the westbound suspension span rehab. So this project, um, similar to the paint project, uh, has been out for a while, and then it's actually um, completed and also um, heading towards closeout. The next project on the list is BB2819, which you're um, familiar with. It's the westbound uh, bridge deck rehab and miscellaneous uh, modifications. So uh, right now the project um, is uh, still on, uh, still working, but some of the, the more impactful work has shut down for winter. Um, currently they're still working on some rails so their rail post replacements, they've had uh, 134 of those complete. That's about 65% of the rails. Um, they have 17 of the 22 uh, expansion joints complete, and that's about 77%. So uh, as I said, that work, some of that work has, uh, has stopped over the, the winter. Um, we'll be looking to restart the joint work as soon as uh, we can. Um, we'll have some demo that's that we can do, um, even if there may be a threat of winter weather. So we'll be pushing, again, the contractor to uh, pay attention to the forecast, and then we'll be seeing if we can get a good spot and get out there and, and hit it early, so that we're uh, we're out of the way with that um, with that joint work. We also uh, will continue with the rail 
um, replacement and then the signal gantries, the lane use signal gantries, those that replacement will uh, begin this month. Our next project is BB3002, which is the Bay Bridge priority repairs. Um, so this, this project essentially performs structural steel repairs, concrete repairs, and other miscellaneous repairs that we deem kind of high priority and that um, have shown, uh, been made known to us through our inspection program. Um, this project uh, is, uh, we ex actually are working, we extended this project to continue the, um, uh, the repairs to enable us to address new um, issues that have come up from our most recent uh, completed inspections. Uh, BB3007 is our next project. That's the rehab and of the uh, an installation of maintenance access access features. So, this project essentially uh, is to repair and modify the um, the features uh, that pro allow um, our inspection teams, our uh, maintenance teams, our contractors to um, to access and and uh, work on the bridge without necessarily uh, impacting traffic. Um, so that project um, started in September. So they're still wrapping up the uh, the field verifications of the um, access items. They're uh, continuing with their shop drawing submittals, and um, they've actually completed uh, the bolt work that we had uh, in that project. Moving on, we'll have BB3005. That's the miscellaneous rehab of the suspension spans. So this is structural steel repairs in the suspension spans on both bridges. Um, so the the rocker links and the lower tower struts on eastbound are finished. We On westbound, they've done the bearings. Um, we've performed some navigational lighting upgrades uh, under this project. Those are complete. And the remaining work is uh, some sh those structural wind shoes on eastbound uh, bridge, and that work will be uh, beginning this this month. Uh, our next project is BB three thousand eight. That's the crossover automated lane closure system, the Gates project. Um, so they've uh, been working on directional boring and conduit installation along the, the shoulders of uh, westbound 50. Um, they've installed uh, hand boxes and manholes, um, and then they're, uh, they've been most recently working on gantry foundations. So they have uh, completed seven gantry foundations on the north side, which is the, the westbound roadway, and then they have, uh, they're working on three foundations on the eastbound side. So they'll continue um, with those that foundation work. They'll start the foundations that are required for the gates themselves. And um, there are uh, new gantries associated with this project. So that gantry fabrication work will also uh, get underway here. Uh, our next project is a, is a one that's not on the bridge, um, it's uh, for the campus, it's BB3009, it's the police building generator replacement. Um, that project started last spring and the generator is actually installed and was commissioned um, just before uh, Christmas uh, last month. So the only work remaining on that is just um, to uh, have a little addition to the maintenance platform for that generator. Otherwise, we'll be closing that project out. Okay, and um, our next project is BB3014. It's the uh, emergency AET conversion that also includes the automated lane closure system. Um, uh, this is one that uh, you are very familiar with. Um, we wanted to uh, thank you for the letter of support that you uh, sent in to the governor, um, you know, stating that you would like to see this project uh, and uh, moved forward as an emergency. So we um, we have actually gone ahead and um, issued this as an as an emergency contract. 
So um, we actually have pre-construction meetings set for uh, next week. Um, and the NTP for this project is next week. So the um, contractor has already been um, providing some early submittals and we've actually had some of the IT equipment that's necessary for the gate system uh, submitted uh, for approvals. So we are already underway and uh, heading forward. So Jim, this is Tracy. So the letter yes. did help and it's been approved and moving forward quicker than it would have been. Correct? Yes. So Tracy, um, the the letter will uh, help, and and this has not. Uh, so under the emergency procurement laws, um, you know our our executive director can approve the use of the emergency procurement. Um, however, we do need to go to BPW with this. So we are currently waiting uh, notification from BPW about when we would uh, be put onto their agenda, and so um, we may be reaching out again and and um, and seeing if if uh, you know we could uh, again issue some more support for for that when it um, actually is going to be on the BPW agenda okay we were under understanding I thought that our letter was going to the BPW so that's what, that's it, what it, verify it, that. it will yes okay just let us know if you need anything else absolutely thank it you will. thank you okay. So let's see, I think that um, wraps up the projects that we have in construction. And we have two projects that are currently in procurement. So the first one is BB2726. That's the uh, rehabilitation of Eastbound Bridge. And it's the phase one of that project. So this is a, a CMAR project, construction manager at risk project. So this uh, actually, this solicitation is for pre-construction services and so not for the construction services itself. So um, we, the evaluation committee has completed their activities in, in terms of, of rating the technical proposals. And we expect that we will be opening the price proposals um, this, this month. And then we'll be uh, continuing with the procurement activities and we hope to award in April uh, of this this year and then that would uh, have a uh, designer and contractor on board that we can uh, get underway with design for that project um, on that Jim <coughs> yes. phase one deck widening and replacement is the widening can you explain that to the group just to take sure. questions Sure. This uh, we're, I almost wanted to think that there's going to be an extra lane or something. Oh, by reading this, certainly, yeah, certainly, it's it's a nominal widening, um, and the intent um, is to just while we're in there doing this major deck rehabilitation, we're taking the opportunity to uh, provide some additional width um, in areas on the eastbound bridge where we can do that. So obviously within the um, suspension span and the through truss were, were limited on what we can do structurally. Um, but outside of that, we can take advantage uh, and, and get a little bit of extra width. And what that, that width will do will um, assist with capacity slightly. We expect that uh, we can get a little bit um, more throughput um, if people uh, have a little extra space that are not right up against the face of the wall. Um, it'll help with uh, some of the the curve and the safety on the curve with in terms of stopping. And then uh, the width, we, we think that there will be a benefit during construction as well. And then um, the lastly, during incident response, um, if vehicles are completely stopped, we may be able to get the emergency vehicles um, to bypass the, the two lanes of stopped vehicles. Um, we'd also uh, be able to turn people around a little bit easier. So there are numer numerous benefits to the widening. Um, so, but it is, as you mentioned, it's not a, another lane by any means. Yes, I just want to verify, because some people might think that's going to be like the uh, Severn River Bridge or something, but. Yeah, no, we don't. Have, yeah, we have no viable options like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Jim, Jack here. How do you yes. accomplish that? What, what, I hate to ask a dumb question, but 
Um, so by accounting for it, because we're replacing the deck and um, we're looking at the deck floor beams, um, all that will will enter into the design. But essentially, we're going to um, you know look at at the design of this um, new deck system, uh, taking into account that width. Hmm. Um, the thing is, as we approach those those sections where we're constrained, we're going right. to have to, we're going to have to taper that back in. Um, right. But uh, we 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 felt like the benefit of that additional width um, in terms of uh, safety and possible uh, additional slight additional capacities, we we felt like um, it was the right thing to do while we were there. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. So then the next project that we have in uh, procurement right now is uh, BB3013. This is an on-call project, which is a just a cyclical project that uh, contract that we issue um, every couple of years. And it essentially um, allows us to respond to emergencies. Um, it also would allow us to, again, um, be able to uh, address uh, issues that come up through our inspection program. And so finally, our last two projects are both in design. So we have BB3004. That's the project to construct uh, uh, a project management office and uh, maintenance equipment storage buildings. Um, so this project, again, obviously it's a facilities project. It's not on the bridge. It's uh, actually on the, the Western Shore um, campus, not the administration building campus, but down off of Ferry Slip Road um, near the, the, the docks that are there, near the uh, Northrop Grumman entrance. Um, we have uh, an, an old Northrop Grumman building actually that uh, we're, uh, is currently on the site and we'll be adding a, a maintenance um, equipment storage building and and the the goal is to get um, some of the the trailers that we're uh, using for these these construction projects and get the um, the inspection personnel the management personnel out of those trailers stop paying for the trailers and just put them into a into a permanent building uh, and finally bb 3012, it's a, uh, a queue detection system for uh, eastbound 50 on the on the western shore, and we're working with um, both SHA and University of Maryland on this project. We'll be installing some uh, additional traffic ma monitoring devices, and then we'll be utilizing some uh, software that needs to be developed um, to sort of uh, analyze and, and hopefully uh, sort of predict um, queuing on the uh, eastbound 50 as you approach the bridge. Uh, Jim, I, uh, Jim Moran here. I got a couple questions. Uh, sure. First one, uh, thank you very much for that thorough report. Uh, hey. This, this um, spreadsheet you have here, can you add another column that would just give us a percent complete of each one of these projects? Just so, you know, we, we'd have a better understanding from uh, meeting to meeting how they're, they're moving along in percentage of completion. That's the first thing. Uh, the second is uh, with BB3002, or any of them for that matter, will any of those require daytime lane closures uh, of, of either bridge? Uh, let's see. So I think we've been doing some daytime lane closures um, for a number of these projects. Uh, for let me, let me rephrase that. During yeah. the uh, peak season. Uh, oh. Whatever understand that um, okay. any, anything there that would have it uh, close one of the lanes on either bridge um i think we we might have some that um the, the 5kv uh when it's when it's having to pull some wire uh you know the the, the cable right. um, may run into it in some of the um the re some of these uh like the the on calls, we sometimes get them out there during the day. But generally, you know, our preference is to not do that. And certainly, I think we took advantage of it a little bit this year because of the right. um, reduction in volumes. Mm -hmm. So the the volumes that we're currently seeing are only uh, you know slightly more than what we uh, you know the, uh, in terms of year over year than what we saw over the summer. 
so you know obviously we're keeping a track on on how the volumes are are performing and so we that would be something we could take into consideration we like to you know use that time to get as as much work out of the way right uh, as soon as possible while you know also being mindful not to um, inconvenience uh, customers too much my last question is on bb3008 uh can you tell us uh what the percent complete on that project is and is all the directional boring complete on that project Okay, let me just go back to that. Sorry, bear with me. The directional boring and conduit installation is complete. Excellent. And, and how about the project itself? How's that? The I think, you know, in terms of the time that we had for that contract, we're about 35% through. Okay, great. Thank so, you. Um, again, similar to what we discussed, uh, what you know, Will Pines discussed last time for the 3014 contract. Uh, one of the pieces of this is the the integration, the IT piece of this, and that's um, that's still underway. And so that's uh, that kind of happens after the physical construction is done. Right. Great. Thank Jim, you. Jim, it's Kurt Regal here. I have a question. Yes. Uh, with respect to the uh, five kilovolt feeder project. I'm just curious, what are the major demands, power demands on the bridge? What are, I assume it's not lights, it must be something else. Well, uh, it does, so that we do feed our um, our lane use signal gantries. We have uh, flashing beacons for congestion warning. Uh, we have our, uh, our aircraft warning lights beacons. We have the navigational channel beacons. Um, we also have the uh, dehumidification system on the bridges to, uh, for the suspension cables. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions for Jim? It's a pretty thorough report. Um, hey, Tracy, if I may, I have one more sure. item as well. Sure. Uh, so, uh, you know, we just also wanted to uh, take a second um, to uh, recognize um, our uh, our police. We we uh, wanted to share that um, Senator Riley uh, had received an email from a constituent that was commending the MDTA police in their handling of the two uh, events um, this past. Uh, summer and, and early fall. Um, so in November, Senator Ed Riley presented um, the MDTA a Senate resolution. Uh, and our re police received that resolution congratulating their work and efforts at the Bay Bridge. And so if I may, just quickly, I'll, I'll read that resolution for everyone. Um, so the Senate of Maryland resolution, be it hereby known to all that the Senate of Maryland offers its sincerest congratulations to Maryland Transportation Authority Police in recognition of your exemplary compassion, courage, and professionalism in the handling of the William Preston Lane Jr. Memorial Bay Bridge. Your patience and persistence and disregard for your own safety are uh, all hallmarks of your commitment to serve the people of Maryland. The entire membership extends its best wishes on this memorable, memorable occasion. Signed, William C. Ferguson, President of the Senate, and Edward R. Riley, Senator. Very good. I do have a quick much, make. much appreciated, I'm sure, by them. So they do a lot out there for the public. Yes, definitely. I I can make it quick. Uh, a lot of folks were inconvenienced because of the shutdown of the lanes, but uh, human life is precious. And, uh, it took some extra time on that one case, but it was well worth it. Uh, I think the outcome uh, proved to be uh, favorable. The guy didn't jump, uh, but this is a tough job. Um, you, you never, when they go out on the road, they never know what they're going to face. And uh, at the end of the day, we do appreciate all they do. Thank you very much for uh, recognizing that citation. That's great. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for recognizing the police. That's much appreciated by all of us, and especially by the MBTA police. Okay. And no Tracy, this yeah. is Will Pines. I just want to pipe in on one other thing on the projects report. Going back to uh, Member Moran's question on the 
daytime peak hour closures, a point to 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 make sure that, you know, for the record, the redecking project is still in many ways in its infancy. We're still in the engineering phase. And so I don't I don't want the record to reflect that we are confident that there will be no uh, peak hour daytime closures for that. The duration of the contract um, may, and the, and the cost of the work, frankly, may uh, factor into how and how the work is accomplished. And so I think we just don't know the answer to that question yet, but because the, the complete list was there, I wanted to make sure it was clear that uh, we point out that that there may eventually be uh, a consideration for daytime closures for that project. Well noted. Thank you for that update. Anybody else have any questions for Mr. Harkness? If not, we'll move on to Administrator Tim Smith. Give you the floor. Yep. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and Happy New Year. So uh, in case you haven't noticed, Jim Harkness and I have the same barber. Um, close and tight. <laughs> but, uh, what uh, Jim did a great job of kind of summarizing everything MDTA is working on related to the bridge. Uh, what we do is kind of coordinate and collaborate with MDTA with uh, any of our projects. Uh, we don't currently have any uh, projects adjacent to the bridge, but what we do uh, coordinate with them as well is uh, just traffic and incident management um, on both sides of the bridge and along the whole eastern shore, uh, especially when you start looking at the, the, the major thoroughfares on US 50, Maryland 404, um, Maryland 90, US 301. So just to give you, uh, I'm a kind of a stat guy at heart. So just to give you some numbers, uh, in 2020, uh, but between the two agencies, we we uh, uh, assisted uh, over 620 disabled motorists throughout that whole entire corridor, and responded to almost 1,800 incidents uh, and events. So what we think we do well is uh, once once a, there's an issue, uh, we're, we're proactively patrolling the whole eastern shore, both and and, and the western shore as well. And trying to remove those those issues as quickly as possible, as safely as possible, to get traffic moving again. So um, that's just my quick update. Because, uh, like I said, uh, Jim handled the the project side of these. I'm just handling the traffic operation side of it. So that's my update. Tim, I'd like to add to that. They have been a great help. The emergency response trucks out there, moving vehicles out of the road, getting the roadways cleared quicker than waiting 15, 20 minutes, or half an hour longer for a tow truck to come move a vehicle. They have been a great asset, and they've helped with the safety of the fire and EMS and police out on the roads with their um, traffic signs and stuff. They, are, they have been a great asset and uh, good to work with, so we appreciate you having them, moving them over to the eastern shore and have them more available for us. Yeah, just and just for the record, I, I guess it was probably maybe 14, 16 months ago, we dedicated uh, additional resources just to the, that corridor. That's much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Anybody have any question, questions for Tim? If not, we'll move on to the some unfinished business. Our next agenda item would be concerns of state ethics financial disclosure for BRAG members. Actually, that, Tracy, we have the Bay Crossing study update now. Okay. I was on the wrong sheet there. Okay. Let's <clears throat> do Heather Lowe from the Bay up, uh, Crossing up study update. Heather? Thanks. Hey. Thanks so much, Tracy, and, and uh, Happy New Year, everybody. I have a quick update for you regarding the Bay Crossing study. So we are working with our federal, state, and local partners to develop a plan that will allow equal access to Bay Crossing study hearings and associated materials, including that draft environmental impact statement. Our plan has to allow access while protecting the safety of the public during the current health crisis. So I anticipate providing more information on the Bay Crossing study schedule in the near future. So please stay tuned. And that's all I have today. Okay, I'm um, sure. Tracy, Tracy, Jim, Tracy, Jim Moran, one more time. Heather is Heather. So we are just to make sure I understand you correctly. We are in the uh, segment where now it goes to the public for uh, all the. Uh, open house meetings uh, discussion? 
We, we are developing a plan for that. That's correct. So the, the next steps would be to um, complete and, and publish the draft environmental impact statement and get that notice of availability out to the public and provide opportunity for the public to review that document and then follow up with public testimony and hearing. We're, we're working on that plan currently. Okay, so are you talking about something that could take three months, six months, nine months uh, for that plan and, and implementation? Hey, Heather, let me let me pipe in here real quickly. Uh, Thanks. Director. So, so obviously, you know, this is a federal, you know, process, and we have to follow the federal law regulation. Yeah. Heather has been working very closely with the feds, and we actually had approval at one point to move forward with virtual meetings due to COVID. Then I guess somebody higher up in the federal government decided that that was not going to meet the federal regulations for, for public access and, and for public hearings, that we had to have public hearings where people could actually show up. And so that really set us back. And it set us back because of the COVID restrictions. So where we thought we were going to move forward, matter of fact, uh, Heather had a schedule that we had um, to start the hearing process the first week of January, this week actually. And uh, But we had to pull that back because of the federal regulations and their determination that we had to have in-person hearings. So. We cannot give you an answer on exactly when that will occur. It really is between, one, the feds and the COVID restrictions. That's where we are. So what you're saying is until we can have public meetings, we can't, we can't have those, uh, those open houses. That's what the feds said. Correct. Okay. It's a federal, as I mentioned, it's a federal process. We have to follow their laws and their regulations. And, you know, they have Title VI regulations uh, that they need us to follow. And we cannot move forward without their approval. And I don't know what else to say to you about that. That's that it's their process. We have to follow it. Right. And their process is telling you you have to have open meetings with bodies in the room. So I, I get it. Okay. To me, we can have two meetings. My last, I think the last meeting that Heather had. She's been working very hard on this, by the way. I have to give her a lot of credit because she's been really pushing hard. But I believe that um, they want us to have two in-person meetings and two virtual meetings. Okay. And Heather, if, I'm, if, if there's any updates. I, I, knew, I, I know Heather was in a meeting with them today, so if she has any updates, she can, she can place in and give that her information, too. Nice. Right, Jim. That's that's true. We we were thinking we were planning on two in person, and and this was before the numbers, the COVID numbers, really uh, started to skyrocket. Um, and we were going to have two virtual call in testimony sessions, but because of the pandemic, we've had to pull back on those in person hearings, and those are required. For, uh, in order to release that draft environmental impact statement. So we're watching hard the numbers with the pandemic and uh, trying to come up with a plan to allow that access to all during this time. There also, um, it's my understanding too, Jim, that, that one of the things that we have to do is provide all the information in a public setting. So Normally, we do that in libraries, and um, <laughs> of course, we had a plan to put the information at the libraries, and I know the Anne Arundel County for sure uh, shut down the libraries, so again, the has that process that we have to follow, and if these things are shut down because of COVID, then obviously we can't utilize those, and uh, Heather, again, if you know, place it on that one. No, Jim, you're absolutely right. Thank you. Part of, of providing
to the associated materials for those hearings is to provide access to that draft environmental impact statement. And we do rely on libraries in order to allow the, the public to, those of the public that need to view a hard copy of the document, um, they would need to go somewhere to see it. So these are, these are truly unprecedented times and, and we are working with Federal Highway to, to be able to move forward. Okay, Jim, did that answer your questions? Yes, it does, thank you. Okay, anybody else have any questions for Heather? Uh, Heather, this is this is Ramon. So just just kind of going back to the, um, I guess the, the the question in regards to uh, making sure that, that that people have a a way to be able to, I guess, review the draft documents. Um, e even, I mean, is there is there an, another way or a way that the feds are kind of prescribing to you all to to use? Um, I know that there are still plans that are kind of taking shape right now and so you know er everybody's kind of going into some alternative methods and even still you know if, if there are a couple or a few that need hard copies you know is there is there a way to to mail them to them or you know come up with not bound but you know something that would be low cost has that been looked at right well Ramon, thank you for bringing that up we certainly are looking outside the box with this and that's um, part of what my discussion with Federal Highway this afternoon was. So we are not just relying on libraries. We're, we're trying to come up with another plan in order to keep us moving forward. Um, but then again, we also do have to have the in-person hearing as well. So stay tuned. Um, I do. I really do anticipate to have more information in the near future. Um, but hopefully will allow us to keep moving forward just doing things outside the box and being flexible with the process. Okay, any further questions for Heather? Thank you, Heather. Next item of business is Thank our you. unfinished business is the uh, Maryland State Ethics Financial Disclosure Exemption Submission. The uh, BRAG was submitted paperwork to the Ethics Commission and has, has formally determined that the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Reconstruction Advisor Group is exempt from financial disclosure requirements. This does not exempt BRAG members from complying with requirements regarding conflicts of interest. So, our next item is uh, <clears throat> the letter, the expedition of Board of Public Works letter support. And we already had uh, Jim touched on that does anybody else have any questions on that before we move on? I think Jim covered that. Jack, you had questioned it, had some concerns about it. Are you okay with that, what Jim explained? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, as long as we're helping the process, I think that's really the, the key. Um, Jim encouraged uh, Bragg support in a statement. We're glad we were able to do that. And I guess, Jim, as I understand it, you can go ahead in the meantime and initiate the process, but at some point, it's still going to require BBW blessing. Is that right? That's right. So the procurement regulations say that uh, we, we can go ahead with an emergency procurement, but then there are steps that we need to follow afterwards, including uh, listing it on our email and marketplace yeah. advantage, uh, and then uh, the step of going to uh, have it on the BPW as notification to them that we, uh, that we did this emergency procurement. Well, that's Let me clarify, Jack. So, so we have delegated authority to do certain things. Mm -hmm. um, it was as to whether we had to go to the Board of Public Works prior or after. So since we do have the delegated authority, I had the ability to approve the project. And then we have to then report that 
to the BTW. So, so the leather still will come in handy. Uh, but at the time, we were still trying to determine uh, what process we had to follow with the BPW. And so that's, so that's how it came. Yeah, good. I, I think, you know, sometimes frag members bring problems and concerns to you guys, and that's part of our role. But I think when there's an opportunity to support an effort like that, it's something that the BRAG members uh, are, you know, very willing to do. And we we were glad to be able to provide that level of support and help it move forward. Okay. Anybody else have anything on the letter? Any questions? Next thing we have is a BRAG reporting schedule. We have Bradley Ryan. Bradley. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm here to provide you tonight with an overview of your reporting requirements. The current construction of BRAG was set up by House Bill 56, a bill that was introduced by Delegate Arents last year and, became, and became law later in the year. In addition to the makeup of the group and other provisions, the law sets up a few reporting requirements for you. The group is required to report to the authority on a quarterly basis and to the governor and general assembly annually. Your, your first report to the governor and the general assembly is due on or before July 1st, 2021. The reports need to generally summarize the BRAG's activities, meetings and topics discussed, education to the general public about the Bay Bridge, how you have assisted the MDTA to provide input on traffic and customer service issues, any traffic capacity studies you may have reviewed, et cetera, and any group recommendations. Again, your first report is due to the Governor and General Assembly by July 1st of this year, but we wanted to present it now to give you an ample heads up. Uh, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Um, Melissa, I guess, what's the best way that we're going to have to get this report together is to collect some of the meeting minutes and put them into a letter or to the governor's office or how's the best way to work that? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, the, the legislation, Brad, is, is very loose on what the BRAG wants its report to look like. So I think it should be up to the group to decide. Um, you know how it wants to be represented that way, but I think I think you're right that your minutes provide the perfect starting point uh, to to get it going. Yes, sir. Yeah, that sort of covers what we've been discussing. Um, some of the questions that have been asked and uh, the reports and stuff are pretty much to me documents everything we've been doing at our quarterly meetings. I'm just wondering if that's enough, or we have to come up with more stuff to add to it, or What's your feeling on that? It, um, if anyone else wants to jump in, but it, it leaves it pretty wide open. So, uh, you know, again, I think that the minutes, as you mentioned, accurately reflect what you've been doing in each of your meetings, what you've been discussing, uh, issues you've brought up, which perfectly encapsulates um, a report on uh, how the last year has gone. Do um, you agree, Melissa, that would probably be the best way to move forward with that? Uh, sure. You know, if, if that's how this organization wants to represent their accomplishments um, throughout the year, yes. If there's other things you think it's important to highlight or bring attention, I mean, this is... This is your chance to report. Um, I see Sean pass his hand up. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, hey, Brad. Um, just a quick question. It seems to me as if you were suggesting that um, possibly the report could consist of all of the just all four of the quarterly minutes, and maybe we would do a uh, like an overview letter just describing what is in there and then maybe some sort of a closing letter or just a letter describing that we have the minutes um, with any other information we want to share. So are you thinking that maybe the, the grouping of minutes would be sufficient with some sort of a cover letter? 
I think so. It leaves it that I, I, my recollection is it says that the group must report its activities. And oh. that's all it says. Okay. Thanks. Sean or Tracy, Tracy, if I might, um, what, what would you go to believe is to put the minutes in? And I think an extra that we could do is all we, we, we post the minutes and we also post a lot of the information that they have available to our things. So whatever we can invite they can be able to the web where that information might be how to be in the letter. And with that, if anybody wants to re do any research on it, they'll be able to do so very easily. Okay, you're really broken up on to the last couple seconds of your report. Your microphone was really scratchy. Can you repeat that again? Huh. Sorry about that. Hear me now, okay? It's still scratchy, it's working up. Not sure why. Um, must be a little interference in the internet or something. But, but, but what I was saying, Tracy, is along with the minutes, if we could probably just post some of the links, uh, because as you know, we post the information on the web. And so if anybody would want to research any of the information that we shared, we could put the links on there and we could easily get the information. Uh, Yep, That's, I'm good with that. Can we have any more uh, members of the BRAG want to give their opinion on the report, which should be submitted to the governor? Hey, Tracy, this is Sean. I just have one more question for Brad, and I'm sorry that, that I didn't um, ask this. Brad, I, I'm not sure if I heard correctly, but when is the first report due? On or before July the 1st of this year. Okay, so we'll have had, what, two meetings by then. That's perfect. So that right? Yeah, we'll have two meetings by then, and we'll have had like the the organizational meeting that we had in October. Um, I think there was a report that was actually due like soon after the or, or before the the official start of the um, of the commission. So we would have. Th it sounds to me like we would have three sets of minutes to be able to include. That that would be right. We should include okay. all three probably. Perfect. Any other members of the BRAG have any comments on what to include in the minutes? And, or not in the minutes, but in the report to the governor? That sounds like a good start, Tracy. Okay, I'll work with Melissa on that and we'll try to get something together and run it by the BRAG and then get it submitted. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Next item of business is an incident management discussion. Commissioner Moran had questions on that. Well, I don't, I don't know if it's, well, I, I guess it is a question, but uh, I, I know we briefly uh, touched on this at, at, at our last meeting. Uh, and I asked about this to be put in there to get uh, the perspective from uh, MDTA side and, and the state side basically on, on you know these uh, backups uh, on either bridge that, sorry about that, that are not construction related. So, you know, I guess that's, that's uh, you know, what can we do as Queen Anne's County and Anne Arundel County to help facilitate uh, uh, the less frequency of these type of uh, incidents? And I know they're not a lot of them, but when they are, you know, the, the one that we're all discussing you know, that, that happened twice inside of, I think it was a month or five weeks, whatever the case may be. You know, uh, Queen Anne's County, I think Delegate Orange is working on some uh, legislation to with stiffer penalties. I mean, you know, tell us how we can help you keep these bridges uh, flowing and at least, you know, remove that one element uh, from something where we really don't have a a it's a it's a basically we're going to wait it out situation versus you know, uh, at least if, if, if that individual is taken into custody, we know that he's not going to be back out on the street in two days. So, you know, I, I'm opening that up to MBTA, uh, you know, any comments, any, anything that we can do there uh, as, as, as counties to help with that situation. I guess, Jim, you're looking to see if they're going to submit 
like any type of legislation? For, well, I know, I know that I know Delegate Arntz and Senator Hershey are, have been milling this around, trying to find a way to do this to, you know, because I believe it's just a trespassing. It's all it is when you get on the bridge. I'm not 100 percent sure. I don't know what laws are, are tied to the bridge. That was one of the questions I wanted to find out from MDTA. You know, is there any is there any laws that are on the books now for this specific type of issue? If there is. How do we get them on there? So let me let me take a stab at that, Jim. Thank you. Um, so it's a very challenging problem that we have. Because, as you know, anybody can drive on the bridge. You have free access to drive on the bridge. And we never know when someone is going to stop their vehicle and get out uh, and abandon that vehicle, quite frankly. As you know, that we have a lot of cameras on the bridge. And as soon as we see an abandoned vehicle, the police are on their way. But... Obviously, that takes a few minutes, right? Because there's no way that we can anticipate somebody's going to abandon their vehicle in the middle of the bridge. And so that becomes uh, a difficult problem to solve. I don't, I, don't, I don't know that we have a solution for that. Uh, because, again, everybody has free access to the bridge. So after, and of course, there's a lot of procedures. The police follow both uh, Anne Arundel County, Queen Anne's County, and MDTA police and fire uh, as far as strategies on how to talk someone down, as you mentioned earlier, as, as was mentioned earlier today. Senator Riley gave us a resolution, gave our police a resolution on the good job that they did. It's a very tenuous situation. Uh, one of the things we have to do is protect our officers. So uh, one of the things that had been occurring is they would shut down the entire bridge, all three lanes. What I asked our police force to do uh, in the last incident was to see if we could block off the lane they were in plus one for their safety, as well as the safety of the individual. There's a mental health issues when we apprehend a person, it is not a criminal offense, technically. Uh, mental health and it's hard to decide whether there's going to be mental health treatment. Uh, so it's not it's not anything to do with us or any decisions that we have to make as it relates to the current law. So obviously we don't do policy where the executive branch, uh, the legislative branch does policy. And so um, I had suggested uh, to your representative, uh, Bruce Berriano, that they do some research uh, on this issue. We gave him full access to our police force and our police um, officer, Lucy Lyles, walked him through the entire process as it relates to our role uh, in these incidents. But again, once we turn that individual over, it's up to a court, it's out of our hands, just like any other incident that, you know, like the as we call him the donut guy, you know, we app- we try to apprehend him, but it's up to a court to prosecute and, and go through the judicial process. So I would just say that um, if I were to give any advice, I would say that, that you have to work uh, probably with the Department of Health in the mental health area and also um, some of the local police forces to see what other kind of uh, actions might be able to be taken and then create the, uh, the policy slash legislation uh, to try and accomplish the goals. I think that's what they're trying to get to, is try to have some other legislation that would try to uh, prevent someone from first offense and be strong enough that they say, I'm not coming back and have to deal with that again. Uh, so, I mean, you, you, you have any uh, thing else that you want to cover on that? I I would say that a legislator could create a system where they could have mandatory jail time. I'm not I'm not suggesting that uh, since it is a mental health issue. uh, You have to be cognizant of that that. But obviously, again, it's a legislature that does the policy so they can create any policy they want. 
uh, moving forward. So, and then of course it's up to us to enforce it after that point. Okay. Commissioner Moran, do you have any further comments on that? No, no, I, that's, that's the direction we were headed. I just wanted to see if there was anything from, uh, you know, the MDTA side that could, you know, be possibly helpful and we'll, we'll pursue it in that direction. Okay. I think they're willing to help just. Sure. No, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody else, um, Barbara, do you have a question? Okay. We thought Barbara had a question or comment. So does anybody else from the brag have any comments on that issue? Next um, comment we have is tolling options for discussion. We talked about this once before, but Commissioner Moran had another question about the um, tolling on the westbound bridge. So, Jim, you want to go with that? Well, yeah, again, this this was briefly touched on at the last meeting and I just wanted to make it a part of the agenda. Uh, as we all know that, the, you know, we, we are in the NEPA, we are we are moving forward with it, but uh, sooner or later we're going to get to phase two and phase two is going to be approximately, you know, I don't know, I, I'm assuming we're somewhere, I'm mean, hearing the numbers around $35 million uh, for the phase two portion of the NEPA to just keep the process moving. Uh, there is nothing in the six year uh, CTP uh, to fund this. And, you know, as we know with, with COVID going on right now and, and budgets destroyed uh, and plans that are just gonna be totally disrupted, you know, it, we need to do something. Uh, and, and again, you know, I, I'm looking to Anne Arundel County to, to team up with us on this, to, to make sure that uh, this process moves forward uh, because you know we are at a capacity issue. It is you know nothing nothing else that, that can be done with this bridge is going to alleviate these traffic problems because it's just a sheer capacity, and and I think we all can agree upon that. So what I you know I I approached and I've had discussions with some uh, state officials, not not many but some about westbound dynamic tolling uh, on Sundays. Uh, you know charging for instance. Uh, $10 for anybody that travels westbound over that bridge during peak summer days uh, from 10 a.m. To, to 8 p.m. Uh, you know, I think some of the numbers we showed from our counters that we have set up, that this would generate about a million and a half dollars uh, a month. And over a three and four year span, it would more than fund the second uh, tier, second uh, tier two of the NEPA, <coughs> phase two of the NEPA. And without any impact to ongoing projects on, on MDTA schedule and or the state budget. So, I mean, I know the MDTA funds everything that they do, but again, you know, this is, and I understand that our governor doesn't want to do anything with tolls, but it sounds like now we're going to be into 20, late 2021, possibly 22, uh, before we're out of the f phase one, uh, and there'll be a different governor in the office. But what I don't want to do is I don't want to have to pause this waiting for the next administration to come in, hoping that they will do this, or is there another solution to fund uh, phase two of, of this uh, study so that we can keep moving forward because time is our enemy because it just increases with more vehicles. So I'm looking for guidance, uh, you know, on how we go about this. If it is a toll issue, if it is something where, you know, okay, you know, that might not happen today, might not happen next year, but it could happen in two years. Well, then what is the process to get us moving forward in that direction? Or if, if somebody says, look it, I think that uh, MDTA could handle that, that $35 million as we just saw the amount of projects that you've got going on that are in the hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, what, what is our best route here uh, that you, you think we'd get the most support for? And again, I'm, I'm, I'm asking MDTA this and Anne Arundel County this and, and anybody else, you know, what kind of ideas do we have or, or options do we have to keep us on track with this, uh, you know, this long drawn out process for a bridge that has capacity, be it here or anywhere else. So that's, that's what my uh, question is to the group. Yeah, I'd like to, this is Kurt Eagle, I'd like to uh, say a few words on this point. Yeah, this is a very important point. Uh, I tried to get together with you, Jim Moran, yeah. about this thing, but it didn't happen. I hope it, it will in the future. Uh, here's what I'd like to suggest. 
Um, I know that this this business of demand management has been discussed at least at some level in the past, and I'd like to recommend that we come back to this, constituting a a group of those of us who are interested in, plus such experts who are, may already be employed by the state of Maryland, uh, to look at this business of demand management. Yes, there's a capacity problem, but more than that, there's a peak capacity problem, a uh, peak which can be modulated by by e economic means. Uh, peak pricing is something that has been used successfully elsewhere. And I think for the, the biggest peaks, uh, it's an excellent suggestion. Uh, there may be economists who've looked into this in some degree some detail so that there's really firm information on how effective it is and where the tolls need to be set in order to accomplish the result that you want to achieve. Uh, so I, I would echo uh, Jim Moran's uh, suggestion that this is an important item that needs to be looked at. I'd like to join with him and such others, especially experts in, in uh, this subject that may already be employed by the state, to see if we can make some progress on detailed recommendations. Jim, I saw you wanted to talk. Um, Jim Ports. Yes, yes. So I want to be clear. Uh, I know I know we had mentioned this before, uh, Jim. Jim Morello. There's too many Jims here on the on the call tonight. Um, but but and correct me if I'm wrong, Heather, but you won't see any extra funding in, in the CTP until we get a record of decision uh, and we have what we consider the the route that we're going to take, right? So that happens after the public hearing process and after all these other process. And then we we wait for the record of decision from the federal government. And then you look to putting funding in the CTP. So I just want to be clear about that part of the process. Uh, I know you keep bringing that up, uh, Jim, and I, I just want to make sure that we're clear uh, about when when that would occur. Uh, and that's one. Now, as far as the demand management, uh, demand management uh, does work in some cases. Uh, it usually works probably better when there's different options to go, uh, like around the harbor, uh, Baltimore Harbor. If you did one facility, you have other options. You also have the city that you can go through at any given time uh, to give people some relief. But but quite frankly, it's not just a Sunday problem that we have. We also have a, a Thursday, a now Thursday and Friday problem eastbound as far as capacity. And of course, a Sunday problem westbound. Um, so you may need demand management. If you go to demand management route, you may need demand management for um, many more days than than just one. Uh, that's I'm just throwing that out there as as an option. And you're right. Um, the the uh, the amount of money that you would need to to I guess curtail some of that traffic uh, may be a little higher than what people want to do, and it and it will probably impact some of your commuters also at the same time, or some of your folks in your area. And Jim, just for the record, I do want to say that, that there is, I know you said there's nothing that can be done other than it's a capacity problem, and it is, you're absolutely correct, but the uh, nothing can be done part, I might suggest that, you know, even some moratoriums on some building, I know there's a lot of expansion on both sides, uh, especially in the Queen Anne side, as far as building houses and, and condos and, and other businesses. So there is a, a there is a partial way that you could contribute uh, by putting more of a moratorium in, in the building, and that would certainly help somewhat uh, as a short term measure. So there are probably other other solutions we could look at, and we'd be more than happy to work with you. Uh, as you know, uh, Governor Hogan uh, at this point may not look at the demand management. Uh, we'd have to work with him to see how he feels about that. But uh, but that may be a little bit of a challenge. Plus, also on the West Bank Bridge, we don't have the um, 
electronic tolling set up. That'd be another year or more probably getting that done, correct, and get it into a process. Yeah, that would be so that obviously be a procurement. It has to be um you know, we'd have to find a contract, we'd have have to have competition, et cetera, et cetera. It'd probably take eighteen months or so just for the uh the procurement, uh would be my guess. Okay. Um <clears throat> I understand some of the um we Queenies might be able to do a little bit to help some of the population on the bridge, but I think Ocean City has well overrun us with the uh, amount of building they're doing down there and and they want to see people come down. It's hard for us to put a stop well, to it. <laughs> Tracy, to that point, you know, uh, I, I appreciate uh, Jim's comments, but we don't have any traffic issues whatsoever right now, last month, or next month. That's Queen Anne's County's traffic and Arundel County's traffic. So, you know, to call this a growth issue, I mean, that's, that's, that is a huge stretch. Uh, and to tell, you know, that's like me saying, well, let's stop everybody from Pennsylvania and Virginia from crossing that bridge because they're causing the backup. I mean, that's, that just doesn't cut it. And we know that it takes 18 months to two years to get electronic tolling up. That's the whole purpose of starting now to build up because we know it's going to take two years, possibly three years. And I, I totally get that. But, you know, in, unless we're going to get some sort of commitment from MDTA to say, look at one we get to phase two, we will fund phase two. But to get there and say we don't have money, it, you know, I, I'm not saying anybody's delaying this project. I would like to say we'll see the project go forward. It's already, you know, phase one is going to be a project in four year term. It's going to probably push up to five, almost six. So, you know, again, I'm just trying to move this forward for my grandchildren. You know, I'm not going to see the bridge, but, you know, we have to do what we for. Our citizens and moving this project forward the right thing. Yeah, I I, I agree. I, I didn't. Uh, I certainly didn't say that the growth was the only problem. I didn't. I don't want to misrepresent what I said. Um, you've heard me say this several times before, but I didn't want to get into a uh, a whole long explanation. But but clearly, the reach the beach efforts for several decades back to Governor Schaefer, if you will, uh, is is a big part of this problem, as you know, especially in the summertime. There's no question that tourism is a big part of Maryland's uh, economy, and Ocean City is a huge part of the tourism. And so, Jim, you're, you're, I think you're old enough, I know I'm old enough, to remember the draw bridges that were along that route. Uh, that used to hold traffic up while the boats would go under. Um, and, and, okay, I thought I thought you might be old enough. I wasn't sure. I was giving you some credit, um, but but you know that whole effort by Governor Schaefer to 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 restructure all those bridges so that we didn't have draw bridges, as well as expanding the highways and the bridgeways um, along that route. And the entire marketing reach the beach effort, uh, as I mentioned, for decades and decades, and it pretty much hit every administration uh, since Schaefer, has has contributed to that capacity problem on that bridge. No question about it. Uh, there's a lot of things that do contribute to that, and uh, that is certainly a huge one. Anybody else have any comments on the uh <laughs> Just briefly, Tracy, this will. A sure. uh, couple of other points to make here. Um, on the the idea of conducting a study on the tolling options, it, it sounds like there's a little bit of uh, competing ideas. One is an idea to do this simply because it will be a source of revenue to fund uh, future NEPA study work. Um, which I can't debate that. And obviously we've talked about that a little bit. And then the second idea is, is to manage congestion through congestion pricing. Um, in order to do the latter, we would really need to do a high quality traffic and revenue study and analyze this in a lot of detail. And then on top of that, there's the engineering costs and the construction costs for any infrastructure that would be built. And none of which do we have funding in the CTP now for either. So I just want to make it clear, you know, from MDTA side, 
I don't want to be a naysayer to the idea of investigating it, but we also don't have funds at this point to to do that kind of investigation. I, and I think when we're talking about it, um, it sounds like there's a perception that this is a minor effort, and I don't think that's the case. The the level of analysis that will be needed to do a high quality investigation. Uh, that would be able to survive toll hearings and the other things that we would need to do in order to implement an idea like this uh, would be quite expensive in its own right. And just want to make sure that that's understood understood from the group. Thank you. Well, this is a uh, Ramon Robinson from Anne Arundel County. So, so one and, and and to that point, one question I would have is: Are there some examples that you guys will be able to furnish to the BRAC in regards to? That type of undertaking, like something from somewhere else, maybe maybe some somewhere else where it's kind of this the similar layout here, but you know, just kind of giving some details as to what the the levels would look like for this type of study, so that so that people can kind of have an idea um, as you're explaining it, what that detail would look like. Well, it, it partly goes back, uh, Ramon, to the. The, the question about is the purpose of it just simply to generate revenue or is it actually the purpose to do congestion pricing? Uh, if it's the latter, sure, we could probably work to develop some kind of cost estimate to do the investigation. Um, but we have done some really high level cursory looks at this in the past. And I'll say, you know, speaking anecdotally, if you will, uh, we're a little skeptical about how well it would work from a you know congestion management standpoint. If you're somebody who is you know going back to Member Moran's comment, if you're somebody who's from Pennsylvania, going down to the beach and you've paid five thousand dollars to go spend uh, four days in Ocean City with your family, uh, even me personally, ten dollars is not going to make me arrive at two o'clock in the morning versus showing up at, you know, six o'clock where I can have that extra evening meal with my family. So it, there is a, a reality about the types of weekend users that we have and the purpose for their travels. And so the as Jim was kind of alluding to the hours that this would need to be in place and what we refer to as the shoulders, how many hours beyond the peak periods it would need to be in place uh, could be quite long in order to actually influence traffic along with having really a very high toll rates to, to actually meaningfully manage uh, congestion. But again, that would need to be fully studied. But um, our cursory look at it is uh not very optimistic so just some thoughts well, but you know, sure we could. well will to that point i mean and, I, and I, I i agree with what you're saying i the, the the purpose of this is is to have a funding source so we can go forward with this with this uh project so the funding source is the first and foremost so that it doesn't get delayed because we don't have funding and it takes two years to do this the 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 bonus was if it changes some people's travel habits be it for one year or two years, it gives us a little bit of breathing room with the traffic. I mean, yeah, we don't we don't think that this is you're 100 percent correct. If somebody's paying five thousand dollars for a week at the beach, 10, 20 bucks, he doesn't care. He's going home when he wants to go home. But at least at least the public can see here is why we are doing this because of the capacity. You know, if the public says, look, if I got to pay ten dollars on a Sunday so I know that there's a bridge coming in my future, then I'm going to do it because right now. There is no there is no solution to the problem, period. There is none. So the only solution is the study the governor started, and we have to complete that study. We have to move forward. And then it becomes, you know, then it's going to be somebody else's problem to fund something that's five to ten billion dollars. And I totally get that. But at least we we have done our our due diligence to get us there. And I think that's what this this organization needs to focus on, because it, you know, it went from these construction projects. And when they get done, I mean, we, we've had a we've had a reprise for, reprise for this last year because of COVID, but that traffic's going to come back, and it's going to come back with a roar. And thank God we, we've gone to electronic tolling. And I hope this emergency uh, construction on the east, western shore works because I, I think somebody said it last uh, in the last meeting that accidents are down 
Some were 30, 40, 50% down, a rear ending accidents because now traffic doesn't do the old slinky, speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down. So that is that is helping and that's that's great. But uh, you know, again, we, we know what this is gonna take to move forward. Just like you said, you know, it might be an 18 month study. That's fine. Well, let's start it sooner rather than later, or MBTA can come out and say, look, it, we will fund it when it gets to that point. But I don't I don't think you can make those kind of promises. And and I'm just trying to help find a, a way to fund something to, versus what happens in Annapolis all the time where people come in with all these grandiose ideas and they just rob from Peter to Paul. And, and that's, you know, that's that's always a problem. So you know, that, that was the intent with this. And I appreciate the uh, the input. Uh, Kurt Regal again. Uh, it's, it's really an interesting discussion, and um, I just want to make a couple of simple points. Uh, yeah, it's complicated, uh, but there is a lot of experience on this. And uh, William Pines, I'd I'd love to, after this is over, to get some recommendations for you and some references for studies that have been done. There may be some flesh on these bones already, and I'd like to become more familiar with it. Um, with respect to dynamic pricing. Uh, this is something that should be dynamic. Uh, you you change prices according to demand, and the prices can go down as well as up. Uh, there is this idea of off-peak uh, pricing, which goes way down. Uh, it's true that there are a substantial portion of the people that contribute to peak loads who are price insensitive. But there's also a significant portion, you know, 5, 10, 15 percent, which are uh, price sensitive and can move off the peak to another time of day. And it doesn't take much of a move. 15 percent is a big move in terms of reducing congestion wait times. And Will, Will if you have any of those other uh, studies, I mean, if you've looked at this and you've got anything, white paper, anything on any of these other if you've had a chance to even discuss it or run a report, I'd love to see it too. Okay. Yeah, again, I, I don't think we have anything that is of sufficient quality that it would uh, withstand a, a, a true traffic and revenue test and that we would be able to say we're ready to make recommendations on toll rates and other things based on it. Um, but, you know, uh, we can certainly talk with the team and see if there's some things that we could provide to, to the group to give some context. And, and, I, and I hope I didn't come across. I'm not trying to be a complete naysayer of the idea here. I understand the idea about revenue and I and I get everything, the points being made. I just wanted to make it clear, particularly my bigger point is just that that to do this right, we would need to do a detailed study and any any, any follow on construction would need to be funded. And we don't have funds for either one of those activities at this point. That's that was my bigger point. Understood. I appreciate it. Can anybody else have any more comments on that topic? Hearing any, no further. Um, does any other BRAG members have any more comments about anything uh, like we brought up at this time before we open it up to the public? One last thing from me, uh, Tracy. I just want to thank MDTA. Those uh, uh, control joints on the bridge, your contractor rocked that thing. I mean, you know, to get that many done, you're down to five left. You know, hopefully we get a, a, a warm spring and, and by uh, – Memorial Day, that you know, all five of those joints can be done and, and traffic opened up. So again, thank you for that uh, that effort and and the effort on the rails. 134 complete. I think the last time we met, there was only six. so you know. Kudos to your contractors, and I hope the weather holds out for you guys and you can keep rocking and rolling. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments from the members of the brag? Hearing none. Is there any comments from the public, Melissa? No, I had no requests. Okay. Barbara, did you have your hand up or you can't have your hand up because you're not online, but did you have a question or anything earlier? Melissa thought you might have had a comment. No, I, yeah, no, I did not. Okay. Just want to check and make sure. Okay. Well, that should be the end of the topics for tonight. Our next meeting is scheduled to take place on Wednesday, April the 7th, 2021 at 6 p.m. May I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved, Jack. 
Second. Second. Second, Jim. Jim Moran, second. Yep. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Everybody's against. Everybody wants to go home. <laughs> everybody, most people are home, so I can't really say that now, dude. But thanks, everybody, and I uh, hope, hope you have a good, good year.